Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Monday. Is it time to hit the panic button, Andy? Or at the very least, locate the panic button if you haven't already. The Lakers are banged up. They're looking bad. It's not going to get better anytime soon. Enjoy your Monday. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. want to thank everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day. And in this case, the first listen of your new work week, uh, Monday through Friday. We get new shows up for you bright and early. Um, and uh, a lot to do today, talking about the game over the weekend with the Blazers, the LeBron James injury, and the pileup of bad news that seems to be uh, just stacking and stacking and stacking. We'll also preview uh, Monday night's game with the Hornets, with Walker Mail of Locked On Hornets and ESPN Charlotte. Certainly, they've, they've quickly become one of the more exciting and fun and intriguing teams in the NBA and one that is a great threat to beat the Lakers on Monday Well, I, I, w- I will say, though, and this is something that I got into uh, with – Walker, um, the Hornets are on a bit of a skid themselves Mm -hmm. and they're having some issues right now. And the Lakers will be taking them on, on the second end of a road back to back. They're playing, uh, they played the Clippers last night. So, you know, if there is an opportunity to seemingly, uh, get yourself somewhat back on track against, uh, a team that is on paper superior, this might be it. Well, um, Andy, the good thing is you feel confident because the Lakers have done an excellent job shutting down explosive young point guards over the course of this season. So, you know, with LaMelo Ball yeah. coming into town, like you feel like this is where the Lake they really could clamp down. All I'm, um, saying, Damian Lillard, all I'm saying is Charlotte got off to a very hot start and lately has not been playing. Very that well. is true. That is an excellent point. Um, but that, the, honestly, that gets to a lot of what, what I think we're talking about today. The Lakers... Uh, they lose on Friday. They lose again on, um, I'm sorry, they lose Thursday and then lose again on Saturday, 105-90 to the Blazers in Portland in a game that really wasn't that close. Lakers got buried early and never really found their way out of that hole. Anthony Davis should be available to play on Monday and through the week. He did not play against Portland because... Uh, not well, because he did of, play. Uh, he didn't he did, finish he, the game. He didn't finish the game. Um, not because he played the first quarter and then went and threw up four times, as did many of us um, after watching that quarter. We thought it might be the thumb that keeps him out. It was, in fact, uh, like stomach flu. Uh, mm-hmm. But he should be able to play through that thumb on Monday and then going forward, which at least gives the Lakers some hope here. But it is very clear, Andy, that without LeBron and without the rest of this supporting cast, the Lakers are extremely shorthanded. The roster imbalance that they have in terms of positions and versatility is greatly exposed and Russell Westbrook is struggling mightily. No one is having a lot of fun right now. No. And the concern that I have right now with this team beyond, you know, whether issues of roster construction are going to come back and bite him in the ass, whether the idea that LeBron, AD, Russ, just the, the high upside fit that the organization was hoping for is not going to come to fruition. All those elements that may ultimately be true, but you know, there's a lot of time to truly play out how true they are. Mm-hmm. Sure. The issue, the biggest issue I have right now is it feels like all of the shit that they've been wading through since the preseason and the beginning of the regular season is really starting to bear down on them on a, in a mental way, mm-hmm. like beyond the limitations that it puts the, on them on the court mentally it is starting to really wear on these guys the idea of just, holy shit, we have dealt with all of this so far, and there does not seem to be any light at the end of this particular tunnel anytime soon. Like, when do we actually get started with the team that we expected to be? Right. It, it's interesting, because like the, the response to the game on Saturday, which was a game, by the way, that once AD leaves, the Lakers have no legitimate expectation to win like they're I mean, teams steal things all the time whatever but the, you know your best player is russell westbrook your second best player is who that mellow play? mellow okay 37 year old carmelo anthony is your second best player that is not good 
Um, and it's actually something that if we don't get into for, for today's show, I want to get into over the course of the week, like really looking at where the talent is uh, and the trade-offs the Lakers have made in constructing the roster the way they have around the big three. Um, but when it was over, they talked a lot about needing to play harder. Russell Westbrook said, I have to play harder, which is a weird thing to hear Russell Westbrook say, because generally the one thing that you can count on Westbrook doing is trying really goddamn hard. And I, I, I think he was trying hard on Saturday. I think he played one of his worst games, not as a Laker, but as a pro uh, on Saturday night. He was terrible. Dreadful. And, you know, I, I, we, there was a, they, they, you know, Dwight Howard talked about needing to play hard, and we had a little conversation about. Well, like, Mel- Mello said they needed yeah. to play harder. I think Frank Vogel said they needed to play harder. The mm-hmm. general consensus after Saturday night's game was we have to play much harder. Like Carme- Carmelo summarized uh, what happened Saturday in a way that I've never heard any player ever summarize a bad game before, and you and I have been around the NBA. For a long time. And by the way, I saw some really bad teams. Like we got up close and personal, some terrible, terrible sure. basketball. But this particular phrasing, he said, quote, I think for the most part tonight, we didn't play basketball. Like we didn't compete. We didn't play hard. I've never heard a player say we didn't mm-hmm. play basketball, which I took as code for. I don't know what the F we were even doing out there. And it, it, it's interesting because like I, I don't, you know, we kind of had a little talk about it. And I think a lot of you pointed out a lot of things can be true at once. They were undoubtedly disheartened. Um, yep. And I think like you said, coming into the top of the segment, like the mentally, I think they, they are about as fried as a team can be. What are they? Nine games into a season, 10, Ten. 10 games into the season. So one eighth of the way through essentially uh, through the season. Um, they look about as fried as a team can be. And so they were very disheartened. Disheartened players move slower. Their body language droops. And so even if you're trying, you're not going as hard as you, you're not going as fast. So I think but, there's that. But they and weren't, then, though. They, they actually, I, I know I'm what we're going to end up getting all into. All I'm saying is, all I'm but saying is. they weren't, is, though. They weren't trying as hard as they could have. They were I, not. My, my, all I'm saying is, I without even arguing about, were they trying really hard? Were they mentally defeated? Were they, to me, I feel like the the problem is sort of what you're getting at is this sort of searching for answers. And to me, the answers aren't there with the roster that they have. And, you know, I, I, I put out a tweet that said, you know, I, I get what they're saying. And yes, you can always play harder. I'm not arguing that. But to some degree, it's we just have to play harder is the thing that you go to. And somebody responded with, that's what you say when you don't have any other answers. And I, that's sort of what I was getting at. Like, they don't have any alternatives. And I think that's partially what's frustrating, particularly to a veteran team that can't fool themselves into thinking they should win games that they can't. Right. And, and I understand. Like, the, the idea that they didn't play hard enough, obviously, is not the biggest reason they lost against Portland. The biggest reason they lost against Portland is they didn't have LeBron. They didn't have Anthony mm-hmm. Davis for all intents and purposes. And they're missing half the roster. Like, you cannot on a regular basis or even semi-regular basis overcome a lack of talent like that, particularly in a place that is just difficult to win on the road, even at full strength. Portland's always been like that. But mm-hmm. I think what these guys were all getting at, because again, this was something that they said and they didn't talk about it in ways that felt cliched or like, you know, you were you were no, throwing out the buzzwords. I think what they were talking about is they recognized it's one thing not to play hard like the way they did against the first loss versus OKC, where they built up that 26-point lead and they just took their foot off the gas because they felt like they were good enough to basically pace themselves. And Mm -hmm. as you and I talked about after their game, they're not good enough to do that. Like they're just, they're not in a place right now, whether because of who's available or what they've built up, that they can do that. Against this game though, the reason I think they weren't playing hard, and I think they recognize that they weren't playing hard is it didn't take long for them to feel like, what's the point? Like, what's the point of even playing hard? What's the point of even trying to go after these 50-50 balls that they continually in this this game didn't get to? Because ultimately, we don't have the horses to make it happen. And I think that was something that was disappointing to them, but also to what you were saying before, that may not be the answer in terms of how they can win the game or how they can fix things, but it is an answer in terms of what are the things that we can control. Sure. And in that sense, I 
it felt to me like they were actually disappointed in themselves. Oh, yeah. And I'm, again, I'm not advocating or even necessarily disagreeing with them. I just, a lot of time, part of what I'm saying is a lot of times, and, and, because I think there's a bigger concern that I want to get to here in a second after the break, but a lot of times when people say we didn't play hard, it's, it, it is equated to we don't care. And I, and I think that is the danger when I look at like guys saying, oh, well, they didn't play hard. Well, if they just play hard, like, you know, they, they, they've checked out of this season. None of that I think is happening. I just, I, I think it's, it's a <laughs> it's lot of the other time. stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and I think they get that, but the frustration level um, mentally is really high. And this is where I think it becomes dangerous because LeBron is out, you know, I'm looking at the schedule, you know, probably at least through the Timberwolves game on Friday the 12th um, of, of this week. You know, I don't suspect he would play before that. I mean, you know, I doubt a week it. or two. Um, probably a little bit longer. And, you know, Kendrick Nunn isn't back yet and THD isn't back yet. And Frank Vogel clarified that neither one of them is close. I think they're making progress, but neither one of them, at least the way Vogel described it um, before Saturday's game, uh, I wouldn't count on either one of them being back anytime soon. Okay. So when you put all that together, Andy, here's, here's what I want to talk about next is the one thing the Lakers have been able to avoid for the most part over the course of the last two seasons is noise. It's the coaching stuff. It's the, what are they going to do? Are they going to make big changes? Do they have, it came last year, but it came last year in a context that was different than what I think they're setting themselves up for this year. And they are entering a place that is very different for the sort of Frank Vogel, LeBron championship caliber era that is potentially very dangerous. And I want to talk about that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Prize Picks. Hey, NBA fanatics, have you heard about Prize Picks? The daily fantasy made easy. Prize Picks has the best NBA DFS prop game on the market, more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator, and offers all the superstar players as well as bench players, only recording a handful of minutes each game. Everyone that deposits and uses the, uses the promo code NBA receives a 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick two to five players over on, under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. That's just you versus the projected numbers. Also allows mixed sports entries, like you could do the over on Anthony Davis, whatever, combined with the under for Kyler Murray, whatever. Just mix up whatever sports you want, and you can use the prize-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Safe, offers fast, easy withdrawals, so don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com. Use the promo code NBA. Go to your store, the App Store today. Prize Picks, daily fantasy made easy. Hey, does this sound familiar to you, Andy? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live. Another lets you stream your favorite shows. And you're wondering, you're watching your sports highlights on your phone. You've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff, trying to watch Succession over here or whatever it might be. I'm going to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle. You, you'll want to hear this, Andy. And it's a great way to get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like nothing you've ever seen before. So you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part there's no annual contract so get rid of the clutter and the confusion get your tv together with direct tv stream learn more about it at directtv.com. that's directtv.com. compatible device is required and content varies by package uh walker mail coming up in just a few minutes to get us ready for monday night's game against a an intriguing charlotte hornets team one of the more fun young teams in the league to say the least um but we, we were kind of talking about this andy the the championship season with LeBron and Frank Vogel and Anthony, the one thing about it was, despite everything that happened, you look at the the COVID and and the death of Kobe Bryant. I mean, all the it was probably the most drama free season, sort of internally, one of the most drama free yeah. internal self created drama free seasons. I, I've I, ever I was going to say with the Lakers. A, a, there was a lot of drama. But nothing right. they created themselves. Exactly. There, there was no drama that was really within their control to eliminate. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that 100%. Last year, stuff came up. There became controversy over Andre Drummond. There became all this. But they got off to such a good start. You know, what was it, 21 and 6, whatever, you know, and you'll bet that I think it was pretty well established that if guys had stayed healthy, the team would have been fine. Like there wasn't. There wasn't a lot, and, and even then it wasn't a lot of, you know, the, the really the, the biggest thing people could kind of grasp onto was this, the controversy around 
Marcus All and Andre Drummond. That was or, the or big. Like, thing. I mean, the Lakers' inability to make Dennis Schroeder take eighty four million dollars. Right, and you know, and so you which know, really it, was not their fault. <laughs> although <laughs> was, you know what, that is. It wasn't their fault, but they, it was an, an indication of them sort of introducing a little bit of drama. To this. I'm glad you brought that up because I'd forgotten about it. But overall, a relatively drama-free season because they showed, even with Schroeder in the starting lineup, they were a really good team. Argue about whether he should have been there or not. They were good. And if guys hadn't gotten hurt, they would have stayed good. I think that's the general consensus. This ain't that. The Lakers made a very large and very controversial swing in the offseason. Um... They filled in, I think, about generally about as well as you could, given the trade offs that you set yourself up for. We can, well, I think we should, we can debate this this week. But broadly, what I'm getting at here is by not getting off to a good start and by doing it in a way that opens up every single criticism that you could have made about how this team was put together before the season started. They're too old. They're injury prone. They don't have enough balance. They're too built around three stars and Russell Westbrook isn't going to fit. They have opened themselves up to a tremendous amount of noise about the big three, about the future of Frank Vogel, about all of these things. It's not going to get better over the next couple of weeks. And if they lose this, like Darius Soriano, our friend at, at, at Silver Spring and Roll for him, blue and gold, like, he said, I don't think they're going to win a game this week. And he could be right. He might not, they might not win a game until LeBron comes back. I don't know. Schedule's not a, like, if they lose five straight, are we talking about Frank Vogel's job security more openly? I mean, people are doing it on Twitter, but I mean, are national basketball pundits starting to create that conversation as well? I mean, look, if it happens, it wouldn't be without any type of reason because Frank Vogel got a very short extension. Correct. And this organization, going back to Phil Jackson's exit, has been very bad at figuring out what they want in a coach. The type of coaches that they've had, when you go from Phil Jackson to Mike Brown, Mike D'Antoni, Byron Scott, Luke Walton, then Frank Vogel, the one thing they have in common is there's no common point. Like there's no thread. Like that is basically, we don't know what the F we're looking for in a coach. So it is very easy to believe that this organization does not have a vision for that and therefore can get very easily dissatisfied with that before you even get to the idea of do scapegoats need to be this is, brought out? This, and this is where I'm that going. Sort of thing. This is know, where I'm is, going. That, that, my is, question to you is: Is David Fisdale the new Jason Kidd? Correct. This is my question to you, and that I think everybody is asking is the one. You know, one thing we haven't seen is when things like because you look at it. I, mean, I think most of the blame, if were I to put it out there, were I to you the Kamenetsky standard Kamenetsky blame pie, which we invented and was literally co-opted by the entire sports universe. It's our great contrib contribution yeah, to the sports zeitgeist. ESPN in Los Angeles, the Everywhere. radio affiliate that we worked at for I've years. I've seen it we on saw, Fox, Andy. We saw it pop up on the jump. I mean, yes. Yeah, I've seen it on Fox. I've seen it everywhere. It's everywhere. Wow. It's ubiquitous. Fox News or Fox Sports? All of them. Wow. <laughs> Fox Sports. Um, okay. But like, um, I don't really watch a lot of Fox News <laughs> or Fox Sports for that matter. I know. But, well, that's what I'm asking. I don't really watch either one. I really don't see much of either. I've just seen, I've seen it, you know. You know I didn't know if like media. Hannity has busted out the old blame <laughs> Joe Biden, 100%. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's, those, it's, it's not a good those, segment with them. Those blame pies have very few pieces. It's one big piece. <laughs> Socialism. Um, so I... We have not run into a situation because I, I I think the roster construction here is much more to blame than Frank Vogel's. I mean, people were bitching about Frank Vogel's rotations on Saturday night. It's like people stop. I mean, you could is he doing it perfectly? I, no, I mean there are things I would do that he's, but you can't win with that group. And like he's being put in a in a difficult position where he doesn't have the people to do things that make sense. The downsides every and there are, there are seventy two games left to, for this to turn around. The downsides of every choice that Rob Palinka has made around this roster based on the Westbrook trade and subsequent well, moves afterwards. Rob Palinka and LeBron. And LeBron. And and, but, but ultimately, Rob Palinka. He is the general manager. No, no, manager I understand that. Team. But I'm just saying, that, but the reason I bring that up isn't to try to give Rob Palinka more meat shields. It's because this is going to be more of the story. Like, yeah, you know, no, I agree. The, I agree. The catering to LeBron. Is LeBron a bad de facto GM? Sure. Like, sure. Know, 
Anthony Davis a bad assistant de facto GM? All that stuff. Right. And, and, and to that degree, we'll find out is, is LeBron angling, you know, is LeBron dissatisfied with Frank Vogel or whatever? Like some of that stuff will come out too. But like we haven't been in a situation where Rob's choices aren't working the way you would want them to. The downsides are all exposed and what we're seeing, you know, gave up a lot of defense to get the off, like gave up a lot of mid-level depth on this team in order to make their top end better with Westbrook. All this stuff, which we've talked about and we'll continue to, where it's not working and will he kind of take that heat or will he find a scapegoat? Here's something that makes it even more complicated if you are if you are a skeptic who believes that Palinka will look for some type of scapegoat, everybody that they got rid of, or or you know, they really that that they got rid of that could either been could have kept around or fans wanted kept around. Caruso, Kuzma, KCP, even Montrez Harrell, hell, even Andre Drummond in Philadelphia. Oh, he's having a good year. <laughs> he's actually They're doing all quite playing well. well. They're yeah. all playing well. And obviously the Lakers would not have been able to keep all of them. And and you could make an argument that so at least some changes need to be made. So therefore sure. they would have had to make some type of deal. You know, the Lakers were going to trade Kuzma and Harrell for Buddy Heald. And at the time, I don't remember too many people complaining. I thought it was a great deal. Loved it. Who, but by the way, Buddy Heald also playing well. Sure. With Rob Palinka, or if you're looking at the way Neil O'Shea talked about uh, Portland's roster during the offseason. If you just generally look at the way a lot of these guys operate, everybody is in survival mode. And I think somebody like Rob Palenka, you know, may have more of a cushion because he's had a longtime relationship with the organization. He had these ties to Kobe that, if nothing else, will mean a lot to Jeannie Buss beyond what they have meant to the you know to mm-hmm. laker fans to laker nation all the laker culture and that that that's sort of what i was getting at when we when i when i talk about you know not ma- making sure the play like palinka is no less inclined than russell we- or than than russ lebron and ad to add russell westbrook to this team the, he is just as inclined to go star before sure. buddy healed um than than these other guys and so you know we'll we'll get to uh walker mail here next but the the Lakers are very much in danger of entering a space of real turbulence, national, every day, on the front pages, questioning every aspect of this that is very different than any kind of turbulence that they've had over the course of the last couple of seasons. Um, you wanted to say something about Russ. Yeah. Um, after the game against Portland, and as you mentioned, this wasn't just his worst game as a Laker. This is one of the worst games I can recall Westbrook ever playing in his mm-hmm. career. I mean, he just was terrible. And afterwards, he was the last Laker to talk at the podium. And he sat down, he's wearing this tank top. And as he is taking questions, he's like administering skincare. It was a weird visual combined with, and a very unusual visual, I've never seen anything like that before, combined with really, really open frustration Mm -hmm. and him talking about how he needs to find this balance between what the team needs from him versus being Russell Westbrook on the court and, you know, the best way essentially that he's being true to himself. And the body language was really bad. And I don't mean that like an unprofessional bad or like Russ was being an asshole. Or no, he was down. Like it's like down, very down. Right. It was, it was extremely frustrated body language. And that, that mood has me concerned that mm-hmm. it's not just reflective of Russ towards himself. It's maybe other guys towards Russ it, a, or just an extension of how the team is feeling right now. And with Russ in particular, it matters because he's the guy that everyone's going to be watching the most. He's the guy that everybody doubted the most. And his arrival, you know, was, if nothing else, more complicated than need be. His his presence dropped a bomb in what they were doing over the last couple of years. And I'll Mm -hmm. do you one more and we'll break here. He's also the guy who's expected to be the guy who brings the energy, brings the attitude, brings lifts guys up in the in the middle of the season when it's really hard to keep it going and all that stuff. And if he's the guy that's down, 
becomes a whole. It's just not going well. Like every, it's not catastrophe. Like there are, it could be worse. Guys are out for the season, this, that, whatever. But short of the sort of catastrophic setups of how the first ten games could go, it's about as bad. It's about yeah. as bad as it's gonna. It, it could have reasonably gotten. Um, Walker Mail previewing uh, from Locked On Hornets and ESPN Charlotte. Uh, next previewing Monday night's game. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar. I love Thanksgiving. You get all that just awesome food, like all you can eat. It's basically just a buffet at a table, but you got to offset that night and the decadence of it with something that isn't just pure calories and sugar, which makes it a perfect time for Built Bars, the new holiday dessert, something that tastes great. You can feel good about it. It's better than like a piece of pie that has upwards of 300 calories on the low end if you don't add any accoutrements to it. Built Bars, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, tons of protein. They're low calorie, low carb, low fat, high protein, covered in 100% chocolate. Great option if you're hungry during Thanksgiving, you know, something to offset the damage you're about to do. And there's nothing like Built Bar Black Friday. Mark your calendar. Black Friday is going to be a huge event with all sorts of surprises. So go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15, get 15% off your order. Again, promo code LOCK15, 15% off at Built.com. And the Lakers trying to get their acts together, maybe um, at home uh, against a young, inexperienced Hornets team in a bit of a slump themselves. To break down Charlotte, uh, today's opponent, we're talking with Walker Mayo from Locked on Hornets. He's also the host of Sports Center CLT Mornings and Evenings on ESPN Charlotte. Walker, man, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. I appreciate you having me, man. How are you? Good. Well, I'm better. I mean, better than the Lakers, but that is not a high bar to uh, <laughs> to leap. Uh, you know, you could you could be basically in the worst uh, state of your life and at least keeping pace with this team right now. Is it is that as bad as a 30 point loss to the Kings bad, though? Because if so, then I kind of understand the despair you're in right now. What's going on right now in terms of Charlotte? Because the, they're on a three game losing streak as of this recording ahead of Sunday's game at Staples ahead, uh, ahead of the Clippers. The Hornets are going to be on the second end of a back to back. Like what what's actually been going wrong from the last few games? Well, it's something that we all saw coming at the beginning of the season, and that's defensively. You know, you even look at some of the games they won. They beat Indiana on a crazy opening nighter, right, to win that game, 123-122, still giving up a lot of points. You give up 140 to Sacramento. You give up 114 to Golden State. And really, that was with Steph Curry not contributing a ton. That was the Jordan Poole game that got Golden State all the way to 114. Defensively, they're not very good and they don't have a big guy. In fact, what was kind of full circle with this game against Sacramento, Rashawn Holmes was somebody that was very coveted by Charlotte. A lot of fans wanted him. We had kind of become basketball savants at the center position because we've been looking for everybody in the league that was competent, and certainly Rashawn (laughs) Holmes is that guy. And he goes for 20, gets 20 rebounds against Charlotte. And so the lack of defensive presence inside, it's really hurt him. Mason Plumlee's done a couple of nice things here and there. But defensively, he's not the answer. Also, Charlotte, their best lineups have been with P.J. Washington at the center spot. And him not going against Sacramento, him being banged up a couple times here and there, it's really hurt the Charlotte Hornets team. The other thing is they relied a lot last year on Terry Rozier's scoring, and he's been downright dreadful coming off of his ankle injury. You're kind of trying to give him the benefit of the doubt right now, hoping that it's just rust. But 3 of 14 against Sacramento, two of 12 against Golden State. You go back to the previous games that he started, one of five against Cleveland, the second game of the season, four of 10. Point blank, he's not been good. And really what Terry's biggest impact is, is his shot making. It's not like he's a great defender. He's not the best facilitator. He's not doing a ton of other things to help you out on the basketball court. So if he's not making shots, if he's not making three pointers and he's shooting that dreadfully, then it's going to hurt the whole team. And that's what it's done here recently. Okay, um, I was going to ask you about the defense, and I'm going to uh, get into that, but what you were talking about with Terry Rozier reminds me a lot of what the Lakers are going through right now with Malik Monk. Oh, who's yeah. Been in a we really, know him a little bit, yeah. That's, what I, that's why I wanted to ask you. At some point, I was going to ask your impressions of Malik Monk from having covered him um, his whole time in Charlotte, but since we're, since we're at that comparison point right now, because Monk is in this place where he's been pressing a lot, he has really, really struggled to score. And he's a guy that, you know, he'll make an occasional play, you know, like there, there, there'll be one or two times a game where you're like, all right, that, that was nice. Or, you know, he'll occasionally be in the right spot defensively, but 
for the most part, like uh, Rozier, the way you were describing him, if he's not scoring, he's not bringing a ton to the table. Like, what were your impressions of Malik Monk during the period of covering him? And like, do these things that I'm describing sound familiar? If so, how does he get out of them? That all of that. The, the thing I'll say that doesn't sound familiar is I actually think Malik is a really high level passer when he's got the basketball in his hands, certainly in transition. I think he's an excellent playmaker when you get him driving. And I, I in fact, I think it's a wildly, not even just a little, I think it's a wildly underrated part of his game. But people that might be listening to this podcast that listen to Lockdown Hornets, <laughs> understand that it is the biggest man crush in the NBA that I have is for Malik Monk. <laughs> so I was so sad to see him go. I absolutely love all of the talent that he's been able to bring to the NBA and not fulfill at times, right? Like I, I at the beginning, we all thought he was going to come in, really help out right away. The shot was never there until last year, and he shoots really well from the field. You know, he's really good at finishing at the rim and demonstrated that really two years ago where he's got a lot of crafty moves down low. And I know he's not been scoring very well recently with the Lakers, um, but I, I I loved covering Malik Monk here. And I think the shot not falling from deep, it's concerning because you did have last year as really the only large sample size of evidence of that, kind of like what he did with co in college. And you hope that that comes back on track. But I, I think you know, defensively, he's small. I think he got better a lot as the years went on. I mean, he was a turnstile his rookie year. It wasn't great a sophomore season. Now he's starting to get better, in my opinion, from the days, you know, his last couple of uh, game or last couple of years, I should say, in Charlotte. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, if he's not scoring, it certainly hurts because that's the kind of guy you you picture bringing him off of the bench, being that sixth man when you need instant offense. Malik Monk kind of fits that role that you think of. Why do you why do you think Charlotte didn't really even make an effort to keep him? man? I was shocked. Like the I, idea that he'd be available to the Lakers for a veterans minimum was frankly shocking to me. Well, I, it, it, yeah. Well, and, and sorry, you yeah, know, the thing is, it's the same thing I said. A lot of fans, he was pretty polarizing, right? So a lot of fans were ready to move on because he wasn't the Malik Monk that they thought he'd be when we drafted him in the first round. But when you talk about Terry Rozier, $25 million as our comparison point, and you talk about Malik Monk for the vet minimum. So Terry was out here and really shot very, very well on high volume the last two years. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But the fact that I thought you could have brought back Malik Monk and still kept him on a team that could have, uh, could have used some backcourt depth for a guy that had gotten better along the way, I think it just was a, was a point where James Brego didn't love to go to him, had a really short leash a lot here. There'd be one defensive mistake, gone. He's coming back off to the bench, but he would have to have a 30-point performance like he did with Miami last year to justify, in Borrego's mind, to keep him out there. It was one of the biggest problems I had, quite honestly, with James Borrego, the fact that he wouldn't play Malik Monk as much as I wanted him to. And then I thought, well, okay, here's somebody that shot really well last year is your best finisher at the basket of anybody in the backcourt um, you know, before they made some offseason moves, and then the roster obviously changes. But yeah, it, it was weird. And a lot of that bet minimum thing is him just taking a bet on himself, wanting yeah. to go to a team that, bet, that believes in him and wanting to play around smart basketball players. But still, if you're telling me he wasn't worth one million or one year, six million dollars, something like that, seven million, yeah, I would have paid that in a heartbeat. And Charlotte, I guess, disagree. Yeah, I, I again, like I said, I was shocked to see him available yeah. like that. You you talked to, uh, before about the defense, and the, if this will be shocking to Laker fans, but Charlotte's defense has actually been worse than the Lakers by a pretty <laughs> considerable margin. And it's interesting, like they have the worst defensive rating in the league as of this recording. But I started looking up some individual elements of defense, like points off turnovers, uh, second chance points, stuff like that. And the Hornets weren't necessarily that bad in any individual ones, which often can explain certain deficiencies in defense, mm -hmm. like what's causing them the biggest problems defensively? They're really small, and it, it it goes back to what we wanted at the center spot. And it's not even really the interior scoring that kills them for being so small. It's that James Borrego overcompensates by having everybody at the rim. So Mason Plumley being the tallest guy that you have on your team, who's not a rim protector. His block percentage is fine enough, right? He gets a decent amount of those a game, but we know that that's not the telltale sign of rim protection in the league, and he gets bullied down there a lot. I think he gets caught in bad positions constantly, which isn't a good sign, especially for a veteran. 
But after Mason Plumley, you can't go to Kai Jones, the rookie, because he's just not ready in any stretch of the imagination. They've got a couple of second year guys in Nick Richards who they've tried to play, but it, it's still not good enough to play winning basketball. Vernon Carey's going back to the G League back and forth. So they're really small. It's why PJ Washington, when he plays, they're just so good offensively. He's a really good three point shooter. Their net rating is positive when he's playing the center spot. But when PJ Washington doesn't play, and then all you have is, well, now we got to get creative with Miles at the center spot. If not, then we're going with Mason, Nick Richards. It, it's really hurt him. And so you see, if if teams have a stretch five, somebody that's big, it can shoot from the outside, we'll leave them all alone. I mean, they are shooting from an island. It happened with Sabonis. When you look at the Orlando Magic game, it happened with guys like Bamba. Wendell Carter was shooting wide open threes because Mason is just not going to go out there. And I think three point uh, the three-point defense anyway just hasn't been very good. So those are a few reasons. It, we, we kind of felt like it was going to be bad coming into the season, but it, it, it's certainly come to fruition and in a bad, bad way. It's interesting. You mentioned how the Hornets are a small team, and the Lakers right now are actually very small because of the injuries that they've had. And they are at their best, or at least often at their best, when they go smaller. Frank Vogel, though, tends to like to go bigger. And as you mentioned Charlotte gives up a lot of size. With that in mind, how would you recommend going at him? Do you think it's better to try to use that size against him, or do you think it's actually better to match match up sort of where they are? No, I, I think I think you know don't overthink this one. You go ahead and put all the size out there that you got for a normal team. What usually. if your size isn't good though, Walker? Yeah, like, well, what do you, and, and, what and do, you so do there? Then, then then I guess we don't have to make it that hard either. Play your best players at that point, <laughs> okay. right? Like you know, at that point for sure. But I, I go back to the Cleveland game where they've got three seven-footers. It's hard for any team to combat, but especially Charlotte, when Evan Mobley is playing at such a high level, Laurie Markkinen and Jared Allen, who was, I mean, just a little boy in the Hornets all night. Mm -hmm. I mean, had like six monster dunks in the first 15 minutes of this game. I mean, just monster dunks, one-handed reverses. They, they They can't battle it. You know, P.J. Washington can get leverage on some guys at times, but other than that, it, the size just destroys the Charlotte Hornets, and it has for the last few years. You know, you go back to James Borrego and some media availability. I remember one question. I don't. I forget what game it was, but somebody asked him about the center position. Hey, you know, how how do you feel about doing this and that and whatever? He said, "Look, if I had the answer, I, I'd love to go with it." But I've been trying to figure that out for three years, and that's with Biz and Cody on the roster mm-hmm. last year. Now, the only way you address it is a rookie who doesn't play and Mason Plumley. So really the answer is they didn't address it, and of course the problem is going to persist. So basically this is the game where if DeAndre Jordan cannot dominate, the fans really are correct. Like just you, you can't <laughs> yes, play. Yes, 100%. Yes, absolutely. Uh, last question for you, Nate. It'll be sort of a doubleheader. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask about both LaMelo and Miles Bridges, who are I think both having good season. Bridges in particular seems like he's on the verge of a massive breakout. How would you describe the progress for both guys and and where do you see the most positive development? Where do you see the areas where they're still learning that sort of stuff? Sure. So we'll start with LaMelo coming into the league. I think the biggest scare for him and staying away from him was obviously his shooting. The shooting has been good. Last year before the fractured wrist, he was shooting 38%. You take that, you take 36 for the rest of his career and call him a great player, but 38 was just the icing on the cake and then broke his wrist. Visually, it was bothering him. He was constantly going to it during the games and then the numbers went down. Still pretty decent efficiency from him. But even this year, he picked it up. It's come and gone, right? Like if if the percentage is good, it means that he's had a five of nine type of game and then an 0 for six game. You know, he's had a couple of those offers, the one for six, something like that. Um, but the shooting has been legit. I think the the decision making when he gets into the paint has been very good. Um, the floaters, those that was something that was actually a pretty pretty nice skill for him coming into the league. But that's again, that's actually been a a pretty good development for him as well. Thing he needs to continue to improve on shot selection. There are games where he falls in love too much with that three pointer, and while it's nice to see him shoot it. He takes bad shots. 
he'll take some step backs when clearly putting pressure on the defense by attacking the basket. That is the best thing for this team. And James Borrego took note of that. So I think those are some of the things he needs to improve on. Defensive discipline, it's gotten better this year, I think. His anticipation, his instincts, they're not just on the offensive side. They're they're good defensively too. But sometimes you get caught, it gets caught in no man's land and you know, trying to figure it out. Um, Miles to me. This is somebody that nobody saw this type of level of player coming. The handles has have been a huge improvement for him. Team defense is something he can still improve on, but even that has gotten a lot better. His awareness defensively has gotten a lot better compared to what uh, where it was the first and second year. And then, of course, you go to shooting for him as well. First couple of years in the league, it hovers around 33%. Last year, you see him show up just in a limited role, shooting 40%. Volume goes up because Gordon Hayward's out, Malik Monk's out, Devontae Graham misses time. And even on bigger volume, Miles is still shooting like 42% from the field, from the out, or excuse me, from the outside and 50% from the field. And then he comes in right off the bat this year, great efficiency, even higher volume, more ISOs. I, it, it just, you, you expect, right? Common sense says, okay, Sometimes these efficiency numbers are going to go down on higher volume, three point percentage. That's a little bit some, you know, you might might differ with that. But Miles, it just stays the same. And I think that's been what's been so impressive. And it's, it's the biggest reason why Charlotte Hornets fans are so excited about this team's future. Walker Mail locked on Hornets. He is the host of the show. You can also see him um, on or hear him, I should say, on ESPN Charlotte. He's the host of Sports Center CLT Mornings and Evenings. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you very much. This is great. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on.